Welcome back to Decouple. Today we're doing a very special recording with Eric Meyer of Generation Atomic and we're actually coming to you from Glasgow, Scotland where we are attending COP26. This is our second recording with Decouple Studios. Uh, the first was on the beach with uh, filmmaker Jesse Freeston and we've set up a pretty amazing studio inside here which you'll see the tweet of. Uh, but this is a really exciting and novel uh, new move for, for the Decouple podcast media empire, we'll call it. Um, we're going to be doing a similar thing uh, in Berlin uh, with James Hansen next Saturday. So just all that to say, lots is going on at Decouple. We're really excited about that. Um, and we're really excited to be at COP26. Um, and Eric, thank you for your help in getting us here. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm glad you guys could make it. And I think it's going to make uh, all the difference uh, in our uh, deployment of uh, Team Nuclear, I guess. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, so Eric, you're pretty well known um, to the, the listenership of this podcast uh, and to the nuclear advocacy community. So we'll keep it brief, but uh, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric Meyer, uh, founder and executive director of Generation Atomic. Uh, it's a pro nuclear environmental nonprofit that was started in late 2016. Um, this is actually my fifth climate talks now, and I've seen things evolve over time, uh, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into. But, um, you know, I think, you know, the reason I started Generation Atomic was uh, that I realized there just weren't other organizations that we're, we're focusing on this work um, a lot, on the grassroots uh, organizing for nuclear power. Um, I started with environmental progress, and uh, you know, Michael has done, uh, Schellenberger has done uh, amazing work kind of developing arguments for the technology, fi finding really good data, putting it out there in a consumable way. And I thought that maybe we can be uh, kind of a conduit for that information to the general public and, and use that to, to grow our movement over time. Uh, so that's why I started it. Um, right. Yeah, happy to be here. All right. I mean, uh, fifth COP. I sort of think of COP as being the Climate Olympics. Um, so I was thinking like it must be an every four years thing or maybe like a summer and winter event. Um, <laughs> like, is it yearly then? Is that... Yeah, it's been uh, yearly since the, the 90s, um, unless there is a global pandemic, <laughs> um, I guess, a little tiny asterisk on there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is my, my fifth one since uh, 2015, uh, COP21, before I was uh, even a, a professional nuclear advocate, I guess you could say. <laughs> right. And I was still working as an organizer for the Minnesota Nurses Union and taking my uh, paid time off. Um, actually, I think it might have been unpaid time off at that point. <laughs> Uh, to come to Paris and sing opera about about thorium <laughs> and molten salt reactors on on buses and trains. <laughs> so, right, that's be... actually uh, you know you worked for a, for a nursing union. Um, I've been really involved in the struggle in Ontario for for wage justice for nurses. So mm. I didn't know we had that commonality. That's pretty cool. The decouple listenership I think is pretty familiar with uh, you know what COP is conference of the parties. Um, but in terms of being here on the ground, it's, it's been pretty interesting. Uh, but again, for the listeners, like how many people are here? Um, what kind of people? I, I know, you know, world leaders are here. Um, I haven't yet been inside, you know, this blue zone, green zone. I don't want to get into all the details there, but just to give our listenership who have not attended a COP, you know, just a, a sense or a framework for what is going on here. Sure, yeah. It's, uh, it's really the, the one time of the year that there's a, a global confluence of uh, policymakers, celebrities, um, you know, leaders at the highest level of government, uh, as well as uh, NGOs, activists, and the global media. And every, everyone has their eyes turned to this question of how do we decarbonize? And uh, you, you can, you know, you're you're walking around and you're, you're, you're talking to some kind of low level uh, NGO activist you've never heard before. And then you turn the corner and then, you know, there's Bill Gates standing there uh, right. surrounded by people that are, are trying to take selfies with him from 40 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, it's a really uh, kind of a weird experience where the, it seems like the global elite get to uh, mix with uh, folks that are on the ground fighting for fighting against climate change. The common people. Yes, common people. us peasants here. <laughs> All right, so again, you've been at five cops um, on, mm -hmm. on Team Nuclear. Yeah. Um, it seems like things are, are changing. We're maybe at a watershed moment. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, in terms of how nuclear has been received, um, what sort of differences are you noting? 
Um, we, we were kind of assailed yesterday by some anti-nuclear activists who were trying to kind of cancel or censor us by holding a banner up in front, but they moved on pretty quick. Um, so yeah, like what, what's, what differences have you noted uh, with your perspective of the five cops? You know, uh, over the last six years, I've, I've seen us go from uh, either um, almost no mention at all um, or, or being a, a taboo uh, subject uh, to discuss, uh, which, of course, you remember COP uh, 21 in Paris as, uh, in, in the year 2015. We saw uh, courageous James Hansen, Ken Caldera, Carrie Emanuel, and, and Tom Wigley, these really renowned climate scientists, um, all, all sit on a panel together with Kirsty Gogan from Energy for Humanity at the time. Uh, and uh, say, like, look, there's, there's no way, we don't see a way as climate scientists that, that we can uh, address climate change effectively without nuclear. We've, we've looked at the math and that's, that's just, it is what it is. Um, and that statement being so controversial that even like longtime allies of uh, like Dr. Hansen, for example, uh, this uh, writer named Naomi Oreskes, who had uh, featured him in, in her in her book um, about um, the misinformation um, about uh, uh, climate change, the and whole merchants campaign. Of, merchants of doubt. Merchants of doubt, exactly, yeah. Um, and, and profiled them in, in, in a movie about it. Um, then when, when James came out and said, hey, uh, we, need to, uh, we need nuclear as part of this, all of a sudden uh, she decided that he was a science denier wow. uh, there. And that just, just to you know, show you how, um, how kind of toxic this subject felt to discuss. Right. And you know, I've, ta I've talked to him about it and he, he said he did lose backing and funding mm -hmm. from, uh, uh, from expressing his pro-nuclear position. Um, so, you know, fast forward a year later, we're in uh, Marrakesh and there's literally five of us there that are trying to make the case for nuclear um, and, uh, <laughs> and the Russian government is the other. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and and uh, I, I wish I had a, a recording of that because it was, it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of the, the tone of their presentation was very much like, Look! Look at these uh, silly whirly gigs. Uh, we we build, we split atoms in our country. <laughs> it was it was very, like there there was no um, uh, like a hat tip to the contributions of renewables. It was just like right. why are why is everybody messing around with this crap? <laughs> right. Right. It's pretty funny. Um, in COP twenty three, uh, we were uh, left out um, uh, from the Sustainable Investment Forum, which is one of the highest profile side events where uh, the kind of climate finance is, is discussed and um, developed. And the World Nuclear Association had tried to put a $60,000 uh, down payment down on, uh, uh, to get a speaker during one of the sessions and get their logo up amongst the you know, many others like BP and Shell and Exxon and all these oh. other oil companies that were allowed to sponsor this. Wow. Um, but then a couple days later, that information had worked its way up the, the food chain to the very top of the United Nations Environmental Program. And uh, as a result, that uh, sponsorship was rescinded. They were excluded. And there was no discussion of nuclear energy at the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy uh, at COP23 in Bonn, Germany, um, uh, to which we protested by setting up a, a, a table outside of the entrance uh, with a tablecloth and croissant and, uh, and then like having our own conference to the passersby. Right, right. <laughs> it's just, um, Kind of we, we thought it was a great idea, but man, uh, the video of it looked pretty depressing, I gotta say. Right. Um, and then uh, it, I think in Poland, we, we did start to come into our own a little bit. We had some really great ideas um, as far as uh, using polar bears to gather attention, um, you know, distributing uh, ba bananas with stickers on them. Uh, that said, like, eating this banana gives you more radiation than living next to a nuclear power plant for a year. Um, and, and really started to get more innovative with our advocacy approaches. And I gotta say that this, the polar bears have been absolutely <laughs> incredible. I'm not sure if that was lifted or borrowed from, from Greenpeace, but what an effective uh, communication strategy uh, to draw people in. We've used it in uh, Ontario as well at, at Fridays for Future marks, marches and other events. And, uh, I mean, just like that simple little thought that I think comes out of the creativeness of um, you know, advocates that are so passionate that they'll come here just, you know, on a volunteer basis that will, I mean, use their vacation time, 
right? Yeah, yeah. To come and do this, like yeah. fuck it, sixteen hours a day, right? Yeah. And you know, um, sometimes have to like take time away from their children. One of one of uh, our delegates here, um, it was the longest time she'd ever spent away from her three year old. <sighs> and I'm getting a little teary because I think it's uh, kind of the same for me. Yeah. I've got a three year old at home, so. Yeah. The commitment of, of uh, you know, these, these pro-nuclear advocates is, is strong. Um, and we're going to get into talking a little bit about, about the dynamics of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sorry to interrupt, just wanted to, to hype the polar bears there. there for a second. Oh, I know. It's, uh, it, <laughs> it's kind of amazing how, how Team Nuclear has, has taken that as our, as our mascot um, mm-hmm. and, and how much people love polar bears and our, how, how many barriers that, that breaks down uh, just by seeing a big polar bear. Um, I wish I could say I, I came up with that idea on my own, but it was just uh, my, my wife and I were, were walking around, I, I think it was in, in Prague, in, in like a central square, and somebody had a big polar bear costume. Right. And there was just like a line of children and parents like waiting to take pictures right. with it. And I thought, there we go, that's it. And I have to give you like a pretty dark <laughs> anecdote that I just heard from Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, one of the polar bears there, maybe several, at least one, um, was like stabbed with a pin by anti-nuclear activists. That's um, disgusting. Yeah, and for me, like I, I don't know the details, how long the pin was, whatever, but like taking a sharp instrument and and using it as a puncture weapon, like it's extraordinary. And I mean, you know, the there's a, a uh, the Amsterdam event itself was actually almost canceled, I believe, by the city. Um, because of fear of anti-nuclear violence against pro-nuclear advocates. Um, so, you know, freedom of speech should be stifled and the city and its police forces won't do its job. And indeed, here at COP, um, you know, at the Fridays for Future March and at the Large March, uh, both times I had uh, police coming up to us and saying, listen, if you are assaulted, if you are threatened by anti-nuclear activists, please pack up your stuff and go. <laughs> yeah. And it was unbelievable. It was like your job i don't know the slogan yeah. in the uk but you know where i come from it's to serve and protect mm-hmm. and it's it's just been kind of unbelievable and i understand uh in talking with adam blazowski we had a great interview many episodes back now mm-hmm. uh, he was saying that uh, yeah german anti-nuclear activists on polish soil uh were able to force um the polish pro-nuclear delegation out so it's true um have we changed? Like, has there been a, a watershed moment um, where the anti-nuclear forces have not been able to sort of maintain that hegemony and that uh, of the discourse and that ability to to block or, for lack of a better word, cancel uh, pro-nuclear advocates? Are you seeing a a, a sea change um, at, at, at COP in Glasgow? It it feels like it. Um, I mean, just on on a basic level, we were allowed to participate in the marches <laughs> this year. Right, right. Where in in Poland, we were there for I don't know fifteen twenty minutes before the organizers of the march, uh, along with uh, the German anti nuclear folks, uh, persuaded the the police and security to ac- ask us to leave. Um, right. You know, forcibly, <laughs> not, not just as a suggestion, right. <laughs> and we had to we had to stand across the street from the rest of the rally of you know uh, maybe ten twenty thousand people there, <laughs> just <laughs> doing our thing on the other side of the street. It, it's frustrating and and just ridiculous on its face when you realize that uh, nuclear energy is the largest source of uh, clean electricity in North America and Europe. Yeah. Uh, to have it not even represented at a climate march uh, makes the whole thing seem farcical. Right. Um, right. But yeah, we were allowed to participate. I got to say, we you know we were both there. We saw most of that march. The anti-nuclear presence was diminutive. Trivial. Uh, it was yeah, m- maybe five yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, five five people. I would say maybe ten. Um, and not that we had a, a massive contingent, but I think you know between us, uh, all of us, there were, we're probably in the twenties or thirties up there. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the ones that I talked to, the younger anti-nuclear folks, they were not as strong in their convictions. Right. Um, and indeed, you could you could see that the uh, the older folks in the movement were maybe a bit nervous about me right. me speaking with them and you know by by how they were be- behaving coming up and and just like yelling repeatedly this man is nuclear propaganda this is nuclear propaganda nuclear prop like just yeah <laughs> kind of like almost a, a, a cult-like um, just repetition of, of words. Right. I have a great story that I heard from uh, one of our uh, allies. 
um, in the Fridays for Future March, the the smallest woman in our delegation was, uh, I don't know, I attacked whatever her sign was know. ripped out of her hands. Yeah. I'm not sure if she was pushed or anything by an anti-nuclear person mm. um, who proceeded actually to come back to another woman in our delegation. Um, and she actually managed to talk to him, simmer him down a little bit, de-escalate. And I'm not sure to like fully convince him, but enough to like really scratch his head and say like, I've got to look into this, <laughs> which is like, that's, uh, Thea from, from Finland. Yeah. Uh, hats off. Um, uh, really incredible. Um, <laughs> You know, so, so I mean, I think that starts to show, right? And, and when you start really having the evidence, the strong evidence, the incontrovertible evidence, especially here in the EU, that anti-nuclear activists are, in fact, pro-fossil fuel activists um, mm -hmm. due to, like, look, Belgium, they're going to shut down uh, their whole nuclear fleet, 50% of their electricity, the vast majority of their clean electricity, mm -hmm. and it's being replaced by gas by a green uh, minister of energy, right? So. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the cracks are, are forming. And for me, just the fact that we're breaking through mm. is already a victory. It's a huge victory. Mm. Like, there's been such a hegemony on the discourse. Like, you know, be that on the medical side, you know, and I'm, I'm proud to be breaking through that with Doctors for Nuclear Energy. Um, be that on the cop side. I mean, there's other examples. Mm. How many people did we see walk by us yesterday? that like gave us the thumbs up or a solidarity yeah. fist. Yeah. It was incredible. It was like, you know, every, every 30 seconds it felt like someone was like, oh, nuclear's here? Oh, that's awesome. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. That's great. And I think it had to do as well with their messaging, right? And, yeah. and you know, there's, there's a lot of um, progressives, kind of lefties in these kind of marches. And we one of our big arguments is that nuclear energy is union energy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the high quality union. people of this podcast don't need to hear me harping on that anymore. <laughs> but I think that turned heads. And I actually brought a banner that says uh, nuclear workers are climate heroes. Yeah. Uh, and the GMB union, the general municipal boiler work makers, mm -hmm. uh, they held the banner for like half an hour. Yeah. Do you guys want to hold this? So that was that was amazing. And being able to send that image back to my union friends in, in Canada. Huge. Was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right, Eric, you know, I want to talk about another kind of maybe a somewhat thorny subject because that's certainly, you know, the allegations of the anti-nuclears is that, you know, we are <laughs> shills. Mm. Um, you know, I run several organizations, Doctors for Nuclear Energy, you know, no industry funding, Canadians for Nuclear Energy, no industry funding, I guess decouple, no industry funding, but like full disclosure, um, Generation Atomic helps us out, right? Decouple um, is growing. We have a, a large and growing Patreon. Um, and we have several non-industry do uh, donors, mm -hmm. um, and you've been instrumental, um, really, in, in helping us as, as or helping me as as we expand and you know bring on our amazing producer uh, Dylan and bring on uh, Jesse, the the mm -hmm. filmmaker who's <laughs> pulled a couple studios together here. I mean, it's really exciting for me. Like this would not be possible, you know, without the generosity of our listeners through Patreon and without the donor. But like honestly, and not to fluff your feathers too much, like. I'm a medical doctor. I'm super busy. I managed to devote myself to the communication side. I have some strengths there. I'm not an administrator. I can't manage, you know, employees or contractors or anything. And, and you've been instrumental in that. Um, you, you do have, I think, a, diver a diverse kind of funding apparatus. But I want to take on this taboo, mm -hmm. which is talking about um, how the pro-nuclear movement is... Um, is resourced mm -hmm. um, and you know I guess the controversy around that is that a good thing is it a bad thing I mean I wouldn't be a cop yeah uh, you know decouple studios would not be a cop like without you and you have a diverse array of funding so let's let's get into that a little bit sure um, yeah like how how is generation atomic funded and how do you how do you think about that yeah, uh, well, the, you know, the, the general principle is that we will accept money from anyone who agrees with us and accepts nothing in return than what we're already doing. <laughs> um, and uh, that over, over the years, that, you know, that's meant that we get uh, some contributions from, from larger corporations. Uh, that means some smaller corporations um, and uh, in, lots of individual donors. We sell stuff in our store. Um, at the moment, um, almost all of our funding comes from uh, individual donors, a handful of uh, wealthy folks from, from Silicon Valley uh, mm -hmm. predominantly. And uh, then we get a nice uh, slice of money from the uh, Idaho National Laboratory through the, uh, the GAIN program, Gateway to Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. Um, 
And all of this isn't uh, people calling me up and saying, Eric, do you want a big check for, you know, because we want you to do X, Y, and Z. It's me and, uh, and you know, our members of our board, key volunteers going around to, to well-resourced uh, organizations or individuals and presenting proposals of, hey, we have an idea to do this uh, in, in this country, or we really want to run a campaign on, on X, Y, or Z. Uh, can you... Can you help make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one thing that's remained consistent. Um, you know, the idea is that there's there's nuclear astroturf out there. At least that's the assumption of a lot of the people at these conferences. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think, frankly, uh, the uh, nuclear public relations public affairs apparatus. It just isn't that talented to even <laughs> try to organize the AstroTurf. Um, so, um, you know, it really does uh, come down to legitimate grassroots activists um, to try to piece things together from different places and, and try to make an impact on the discourse. And I mean, what that looks like is um, housing some people. You know, I mean, uh, renting uh, an Airbnb or a hotel in Glasgow is like, what, $900 a month. We're out here far off in the countryside, I think, where there's yeah. something much more affordable. Yeah. And we've been a little crammed in like sardines. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Jesse and I, uh, filmmaker Jesse Friesen and I were uh, sleeping on the floor in one of the living rooms for uh, <laughs> the last couple of days. Uh, I do a lot of camping. That's, that's yep. not a problem Had a whole, at all. whole pillow for it out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just for like full kind of COVID disclosure, you know, um, we are doing rapid antigen tests every single day um, you know we yeah. PCR before coming here we PCR on the second day so I know you know for some of the listeners it might be like whoa this this is not two meters <laughs> you know we're not masked yeah. but, and we're all uh, vaccinated as well all vaccinated yeah and I mean that's that's been something just this is kind of a total aside but you know uh, yep. I've been you know super cautious in Canada we're, we're kind of very like law abiding respectful people so it's it's that's been kind of a neat experience it's been great you know all of my mm -hmm. up until COP26 you know, I've had this incredible opportunity to interview, I think, 96 people thus far um, and interact with advocates around the world uh, on and off decouple. Um, and that's been a two-dimensional experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is better than, a, you know, a, a masked experience and never seeing anyone's face. But it's, it's awesome to, uh, to finally meet in 3D here. Yeah, same. <laughs> cool. So... Um, you know, there, there are, the, the nuclear industry is here. Mm -hmm. um, presumably they have like professional public relations people, firms that they hire, um, you know, uh, who interact with media, politicians. Um, how is that different from, you know, what Generation Atomic does or the other, um, you know, organizations that use a lot of uh, volunteer work? Um, yeah, how, how does that differ? Um, and what's, what, like, pitch us, like what's the importance of a group like Generation Atomic here? Um, you know, sometimes I think the uh, the glossier an, an ad campaign, the more more produced a a, a video might look, and so that so that it becomes kind of corporate in nature. Um, maybe the less credible it it might seem. Um, you know, you can clearly tell <laughs> if you look close on some of the materials we're handing out. Like maybe there's a letter cut off here and there. It's it's clear somebody um, pasted this together in in Canva <laughs> or something. Um, uh, you know, even though we have some very uh, uh, talented folks, we don't have a, a lot of graphic designers <laughs> right. amongst us. Um, but we do have a lot of uh, engineers and um, technical people, so we can um, like dig into the environmental product declarations and the life cycle analyses, all the latest studies to back up our arguments that nuclear power is the fastest uh, clean energy source to ever be deployed. Um, in, in like a, a larger uh, country, um, it, is, uh, it requires the least amount of mining, the least amount of land, and make those comparisons like, okay, how much would it take to power Glasgow uh, on wind, solar, nuclear, including mining and transmission, and know with confidence. Uh, these are the, the actual numbers according to the best available science. Um, so we don't see uh, the, the PR firms mm -hmm. that are being hired by I guess we'll call it big nuclear for lack of a better word, which I put heavy air quotes because really it really isn't that big. Um, but they're, they're coming up with uh, things that maybe sound and look a little bit, a little bit different. You know, you know, like in terms of um, the last three years of learning about nuclear energy and, and being an advocate more recently, um, like it's a lot of study, right? Like mm. I've spent countless hours doing research um, analyzing the critiques, you know, what some of the responses are, trying to keep a really open mind, a beginner's yeah. mind, 
Yeah, I'm always trying to figure out where I'm on the Dunning Kruger curve. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, like a professional ad agency that does all kinds of other campaigns, they are not used to the unique challenges of advocating for nuclear energy. Um, mm-hmm. They might be amazing at, at what they do and what they've done in other campaigns, but I think there's like I don't know what like a at least one year, two year learning curve. Like yeah. to get your black belt in nuclear advocacy is not something that <laughs> happens like um, on a, on a short time frame. And I think. Yeah because we're so engaged as volunteers or as passionate advocates in, in this discourse, like we're, we're kind of uniquely like well equipped, um, right, to, right. to engage with that. Yeah. Um, I think that's why you get so many creative ideas, um, from the advocacy community. So what, like, what are some of those creative ideas? What's happened so far at COP? All right. There's a flash mob. There, there's a flash mob, uh, that net zero needs nuclear flash yeah. mob. Um, so, you know, we got some professional dancers to choreograph this, this uh, song, uh, it's a, a parody of the, uh, the Bonnie uh, Tyler, uh, We Need a Hero. Um, we need well, Net Zero. We need Net Zero. <laughs> okay, there may have been a professional choreographer, but the, the guy who stole the show um, is a nuclear engineer, reactor <laughs> designer, and yes. like pretty phenomenal break dancer. Oh my gosh. So he was, he was a volunteer in this whole thing. It was like, it's a cool video. If you haven't checked yeah, it out, we'll share it in the show notes. It's nuclear physicist that works at Moltex and <laughs> happens to be an amazing break dancer. Yeah. 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 Definitely, definitely check that out. But okay, that's so flash mob. What, what else? Yep. Uh, this year we, we decided a kind of a central um, image uh, uh, for our messaging was going to be a gummy bear. Right. Um, thanks to uh, another uh, activist, uh, Isabel. Isabel <laughs> shout outs. Yeah. Shout outs. Um, so uh, they decided that, hey, we need something really visual, something for the media to take video of. So let's, let's get a, a three meter high uh, giant gummy bear and have that for like photo ops and everything and, and move it all around the cop in different locations. And um, that's, it's so important to have a, something visual that the media can, can put on their website. And, and uh, you know, kudos to the Young Generation Network for deciding to do that. Um, gummy bear, of course, representative of about the size of a, uh, a fuel pellet and uh, the, the massive amount of energy that provides, you know, similar to a ton of coal. Yeah. Um, and Check out Isabel's video. Yeah, you'll, you'll for more see information. That <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just worked worked out that uh, we figured out how big the massive three meter tall uh, gummy bear could provide, and we got about about sixteen months of electricity for Glasgow. Um, as a oh, that three meter tall. Yeah. Glasgow. Wow. Which, I mean, it's a big gummy bear, but Glasgow is also like 1.6 million people. So right. pretty darn. Yeah. That's a lot of power. Yeah. That's pretty nutty. That's pretty yeah. nutty. So of course, uh, the participation in the demonstrations as well. Um, and you know, I was interviewed by ABC news. Um, we've had interviews with like advocates, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, CNN, BBC, yeah. And even German national television. Yeah. Uh, Arun Gadan and Miguel. And, um, yeah. T- uh, I forget his sorry, last name. Miguel. <laughs> yeah. It's a hyphenated. Right. So Miguel TL. <laughs> so like the grassroots and volunteer advocates um, are, are, you know, getting, getting attention, getting pretty they serious are. attention. Yeah. 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 yeah, putting a, a whole new face on on this industry, uh, which uh, you know for for decades has kind of been been seen as a as a bit a bit dusty, uh, yeah. bunch of bunch of old dudes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, one one thing we we both attended the other day was the World Nuclear Association. I'm not sure what it was a mixer. Yeah, networking event or yeah, yeah. cocktail reception. Yeah, and it was interesting because um, again, it's these uh, engineers and scientists who perhaps, you know, constructive <laughs> feedback. I mean, who have a different different take than like you're yeah. you're like a musical theater opera singer, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna bring different strengths to the table in terms of comms. Um, and it was interesting because there was effusive praise from you know these. Uh, like engineers, scientists, uh, you know, uh, reactor designers, uh, corporate leaders, etc. Yeah. Uh, effusive praise of you know what the youth were accomplishing this this kind of breakthrough moment. Um, you know, and I actually there was a bit of a frustration though that it was kind of seven people on stage. Um, you know, great speakers, and I think speaking a new language of you know pride in what we do. Um, in not being on the back foot in terms of you know mm-hmm. what nuclear energy accomplishes, not being apologetic, but a bolder stance. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and I, I think there was some credit given to the fact that it's like it's the young generation, it's, it's Generation Atomic, it's Stand Up for Nuclear, it's this grassroots volunteer yeah. activism that is, is leading to that moment. Yeah. Um, but not invited onto the stage per se. And, and it, it was something I, I did talk to the Secretary General of the World Nuclear Association and <laughs> said, like, constructive feedback, like, <laughs> bring somebody up here, you know? Yeah. Um, so, in terms of, we talk a lot about like energy returned and energy invested. Um, you were mentioning, um, you know, some of the funding that you get. You know, it's interesting to look at um, the funding of other in, uh, other advocacy organizations um, mm -hmm. or and organizations here. So, um, you know, one thing I was looking at recently is the National Resource Defense Council, mm -hmm. um, instrumental in the closure of Indian Point. Um, and the, the Environmental Defense Fund uh, combined annual budget this is not their assets and everything, but what they can spend each year is $348 million a year. Um, uh, NRDC got another $100 million from Jeff Bezos. Um, Sierra Club took $25 million from a uh, natural gas company. Yeah. Um, World and, Wildlife Fund, $100 million from Bezos as well. Right. So we're talking like enormous money. Mm. Um, you were involved in the campaign to save Byron and Dresden. Yeah. And it's like, to me, this is like a David and Goliath thing. But just for full disclosure, like what is your annual operating budget? How does it compare to those numbers? Uh, it's it's kind of right in that like two hundred dollars to $300,000 range. Um, yeah, there have been years when it's a little more, years when it's a, a little less. Um, but yeah, kind of right in there. And obviously, I'd, I'd love for that to triple or quadruple so we could hire more full-time staff because a lot of times it's, you know, it's, it's been just me full-time. And then if I have a project here or there, I, I kind of hire contractors temporarily for a while. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to build a, a long-term institution that can continually grow when you're on a small budget, because um, you're you're constantly being pulled with, well, do I try to go raise more money so I can build a bigger team, or do I ad address this uh, this fire that's happening right now with like the potential closure of, of Byron and Dresden, and try right. to put out fires here and there? Oh God, nuclear is not going to be included in the sustainable finance taxonomy. Right. I guess I won't talk to my donors for the next four months while I, while I work on doing everything I can with the volunteers that we have to address that. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's a constant tension. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, after the climate talks, um, kind of <laughs> we uh, were able to take a little bit of a, a, a victory lap on, on 2021 and um, have a really strong fundraising season set us up for success next year. Right. Yeah. But okay. yeah, it, it is a David and Goliath, as, as you said. And without uh, vol like hundreds of volunteer hours, um, we, I don't think that Byron and Dresden would have been saved. Passed by one vote? <laughs> yeah. Right? One vote. I yeah. mean, that, that yeah. proves the point. On the right? last possible day of the extended extra session that wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah. And uh, with all, all kinds of concessions that aren't really that great, but um, at least the nuclear plants uh, had a stay of execution. Right, right. So... Not a, not one full time staff position exclusively devoted to the the largest climate uh, conference in the world. Oh. Um, your your um, attention is split between saving Byron and Dresden, working on the EU green taxonomy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean we're in the same uh, housing right now, and, and like I see you <laughs> running around, going to bed at like four in the morning, getting up at seven. So, and I see a lot of people like that, like Arun as well. Like, yeah. I don't know. He must. He must use some eye makeup or something, because like I don't know how the guy does it. These people have not slept, uh, know, but it, it gets no. a really. It's a really important moment. Yeah. Um. All right. Um. Yeah. I mean, I just. I just think this like conversation around. Um. You know, the revolution will not be funded, kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't televised, but there's actually a really good book um, called "The Revolution Will Not Be Funded." But, um, you know, like Alec allegations fly when you stand up for nuclear that you are a shill. I can't count the number of times I've been called a shill. Actually, it's probably not that many because I really do think the anti-nuclear movement is, is fading. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly something that you face. Um, again, uh, you know, my organizations are, are, you know, like squeaky clean, but it's, it's, strange, like, it's strange like having to really like make a big point of that. And there is this thing about being, um, you know, a, a Puritan or being pragmatic, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's certainly a danger to, um, you know, if, you know, one of my organizations, Canadians for Nuclear Energy, we have uh, $1,800 in our bank account. I, I accidentally put 1100 in because of some <laughs> PayPal fuck up. Um, you know, so total goddamn shoestring. Um, but what we've accomplished, like this House of Commons petition, a, a really Huge. strongly worded pro nuclear petition right on the floor of the House. Uh, an open letter with retired political figures from across our political spectrum, James Hansen, you know, leading engineers, climate scientists, etc. I mean, I'm blank on what we've done. Um, you know, open letters to the media, holding stand-up for nuclear events across the country, mm -hmm. uh, building a national level organization. Yeah. Right? That's been on a shoestring. Now, it's interesting because I'm, I'm, you know, as much as it's kind of tempting to try and find funding for this, um, I'm really happy not to be uh, have anything to do with that because I see ways mm -hmm. in which um, sometimes the, the nuclear industry or establishment um, has a really sort of like this is the company <laughs> line do right. not stray from it we're all on the same page right yeah. and in Canada you know our organization <laughs> uh, finds itself kind of bizarrely enough um, not on the same page um, and, and a thorn in the side of, of much of the nuclear establishment um, and you know there's organizations like Young Generation and, and Women in Nuclear who I find are constrained in terms of what they can say. That being said um, we were hosted by the CNA mm -hmm. uh, we were hosted by women's, Women in Nuclear so Mm -hmm. You know, but anyway, I'm just trying to, you know, I think emphasize um, the the importance of that independence. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, like our relationship and what you've done uh, for decouple, like it has a different vibe. Like that's a disclosure yeah. I have to make, right? Like you get yeah. funding from industry. Um, you know, you help with payroll. You help with things that mm -hmm. I just can't do and make happen. Um, like. What, what do you think about this, um, again, Puritan versus Pragmatics? Like, ultimately, like, I think we're in it to win it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some kind of a balancing act that needs to happen. Yeah. I mean, in, in Illinois, uh, for example, uh, we, we were campaigning there for, for two years. Um, and, you know, towards the beginning of that, uh, we approached Exelon and we're like, hey, we want to do everything we can to help save these nuclear plants. Can you help? Mm -hmm. And through our sister organization, Gamma, uh, which stands for Generation Atomic Movement Mobilizing Alliance, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, we can take a little bit of money there and, uh, and then pay canvassers with it to go to different uh, college campuses and you know, make the argument, gather petition signatures, hold events. Um, and all that was going quite swimmingly until a global pandemic uh, <laughs> happened and, and uh, derailed a lot of that. Um, and then be because of kind of the uh, difficulty of doing in-person campaigning there, uh, we switched our, our campaign uh, to online, to being with volunteers mostly, ended up uh, sending over a thousand uh, fax messages to the leadership of uh, the Illinois Assembly and the governor's office and his key negotiator um, in support of saving these plants, submitted multiple letters to the editor uh, and, and had uh, you know, a, a dozen or so uh, meetings with uh, elected officials and their staff about this, um, uh, not to mention all the phone banking and calling um, all the members we, through our analysis, had, had found to be persuadable and not have a, a currently known position on saving the nuclear plants. And we got so many of them to commit to, okay, you got it right. If, they're, if the bill won't, will not save the nuclear plants, I will not support it. And we got that commitment from several people who were uh, pretty wishy-washy before. And um, I don't think that uh, th that would have been as persuasive if it was like, okay, here, here comes the, the lobbyist from Exelon or whatever. But instead it's like, here comes Alyssa Hayes, uh, from, who grew up, uh, she's like a, a, you know, a PhD student um, who grew up in Illinois near Zion Nuclear Power Plant, which was shut down early. And, and you know, that, that started off a, just an economic disaster uh, for that area where housing values cratered, taxes went up, uh, class sizes ballooned as teachers were, were laid off. And it just, the, as the town just got kind of hollowed out on the inside from its, from its uh, very best employer. Um, so she can speak authentically. She didn't get a dime to do any of that advocacy, spent hundreds of hours on it and had a, a story of how it personally affected her. That's, that packs so much more of a punch than uh, somebody who's uh, paid, paid to be there saying something they were paid to say. Um, but 
I don't know. I mean, the so the you know the accusation is going to be there, mm -hmm. but looking around, uh, everybody at this cop who's here on on Team Nuclear, I can say uh, maybe for sure under the age of fifty, <laughs> yeah. um, is here because they really believe in this. Um, they they see it as an absolute imperative for uh, the future of, of our species, and they see that they have a role to play in, in uh, bringing nuclear a stronger voice and getting it into the, into the energy mix in a big way. Okay, this is maybe a rhetorical question. I don't, I don't read it, I don't okay. pitch it to you, right? But, All right. Um, you know, in terms of the, the genuineness, um, you know, the goodwill, the purity of, of the messages of, of volunteers, mm -hmm. um, do you think that would be affected, cheapened, they'd be less authentic if, for instance, you know, our, our I, call, I want to call her like our sister just because, uh, you know, we've, we've been living together for a few days and, <laughs> and uh, our ally, however we want to put it, um, if... You know, she had a stipend to pay for the child care for her child while she was away. Mm. If she had, you know, her travel covered. Um, you know, if there was a full-time paid cop organizer, um, would that, again, this is totally rhetorical. Yeah. <laughs> Softball, but would that, yeah. like, would that make Astrid less of a, um, like, would that affect her? Would that compromise her? No, like, absolutely not. Yeah, and I found myself kind of answering that question with a few anti-nuclear people yesterday in the march where I'm like, would you prefer that these young nuclear engineers, uh, you know, uh, for, forego paying their student loans for a couple months <laughs> in order to come here? Like, these are young professionals here. They, this is a huge sacrifice for them personally uh, to take time off of work. And, uh, you know, having, having a hotel room paid for is, is not exactly like <laughs> persuasive money to forego all of your, your morals and ethics. <laughs> like, right. they're not that cheap of dates, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, it, it wouldn't. And there needs to be a lot more support for passionate grassroots advocates uh, coming to the COP, coming to all sorts of uh, conferences, events worldwide in the broader clean energy community. Because I think the shill thing is like, like anti-nuclear people are like genuinely puzzled about why it is we feel the way we do. And I, I was trying to think like, what would stir me to do the crazy things they're doing? To stab a fucking polar bear, um, to just drown, try and drown people out, to, you know, um, censor, like, free speech. And I'm like, the only circumstance I can see in, of myself is, like, if there were neo-Nazis um, protesting in my city. Like, I might take some of those same measures. Like, maybe those tactics are, by definition, not... I don't think they are. They're not uh, condemnable under all situations, but maybe that's how they interpret us, right? Yeah. And so, and I think that's what really has dispelled things, like, and I want you to share, like, your most potent personal anecdote in terms of um, dealing with a skeptic. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, the other day, it was just, like, talking with this, uh, you know, fairly elderly woman, um, you know, and she's just like, why are you doing what you're doing? Who's paying you? And, you know, I held up my medical badge and I'm like, Medicare, you know, in my country is like, that's who I, that's how I earn my living. Um, you know, I, I'm a staff physician at the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. You know, I work with, uh, you know, migrant seasonal agricultural workers, you know, and they're just like, what? Um, you know, and so I think that's the, this whole shill thing is that like, oh, it's, you're doing it for the money. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're preaching this horrible thing. And it's because you've been bought off. Like, how could you believe yeah. what you believe? So I don't know. Like, what was your most uh, like potent moment? I mean, we're only a week into cop, but <laughs> yeah. so far in terms of like uh, you know whatever moment yeah. that you had with with a skeptic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I had a similar conversation. Like, who's paying you? And I uh, <laughs> I just started uh, sharing names. I was like, well, there's Carl, and then there's Ross, and yeah. you know, <laughs> have you heard of this company? Well, uh, so and so was an early employee, and uh, now they want to help save the world, so they uh, help pay for me to be here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, honestly, uh, if I could afford to do it for free, I I would anyway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, yeah it's 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 tough because people. I, I get why they think that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there certainly have been um, instances of AstroTurf um, in the past. Uh, most recently, I think, for a natural gas plant in Louisiana is the mm -hmm. um, one I, I've heard of most recently. But I, I get why they're skeptical. But obviously, we're, we're just here because we care and mm -hmm. we're ready to fight. Yeah. No, that's, that's very interesting. So 
cop is uh, not close to being over. Um, I understand the mm. first week is more like when the politicians show up in the line that actually Barack Obama is uh, going to be there tomorrow. Wow. Um, but you know, what are you uh, what are you hopeful for in the next week? I think we saw that mm. the big uh, marches, the big sort of uh, outs, people who don't have tickets to the event, out on the streets. Um, yeah making themselves heard like you know for me what what should i expect in the next week um well i'm i'm glad you are uh, multilingual because that has proven to be extremely helpful in the blue zone uh talking to people i mean you know this last week david watson uh louisa uh de cairns were uh uh talking to uh pr people pretty high up you know ministers of the environment uh sometimes they talked to the, the president of Colombia. they had a really like deep conversation right. um, with him uh, and they're talking to people you know three different languages uh, in the, the upper upper chambers of several uh, different countries and making those connections making the arguments for nuclear that they have never heard before right. um, because you know it's, it's still pretty hard to just stumble upon uh, the uh, scientifically evidence, you know, the evidence-based arguments for nuclear on, on the internet or on TV or anything like that. So sometimes it needs to just pop up in front of you and <laughs> hand you a postcard uh, that, that says something like, you know, let rivers be rivers, switch to nuclear and, you know, re rewild or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when, when hydro has, has had some, some impacts on your country, and uh, you're looking for ways to continue to electrify without uh, flooding areas out or, or going to coal or anything like that, then mm -hmm. if you haven't heard an argument for nuclear, it's pretty powerful. So those conversations continue to happen. I'm hoping we continue to reach out to other NGOs. Um, we had a networking event uh, last week on Tuesday that had, it was about maybe 30% nuclear people who organized it mm -hmm. and uh, like 70% uh, people from random NGOs, and we just had this uh, beautiful little uh, open mic segment at the end of it where I just threw the question out. Um, I was like, all right, everybody, uh, open mic time. You can uh, have two suggested questions here. Uh, talk about something you're proud of that you've worked on with your, your organization or you, you are working on uh, actively. Uh, and then if you, could, if you were in charge and could fix one important problem, what would it be and how would you do it? And we just got these like heartfelt speeches from people all over the world who had been, you know, working on um, various issues uh, connected to climate change. Right. Um, so I want to continue to build bridges into other communities because Team Nuclear has been so insular for the last 50, maybe since like Adams for Peace. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, after. After, since after we I, lost Walt Disney. After we lost Walt and yeah, Eisenhower, it's just been like, okay, no, no, you know, hide under a blanket and hopefully everybody will forget about us. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're definitely taking the opposite strategy now. <laughs> so again, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, I, th I think another really useful resource and Decouple is working on this with uh, like, and we haven't decided what to call it yet, but kind of nuclear talking points or advocacy mm -hmm. talking points, you know, web page with, you know, how to respond to questions about waste, how to respond to questions about proliferation, how to respond to questions about climate, et cetera, um, that's accessible, that's kind of Twitter length, that's, that's resourced. Um, I know other groups have done things like that, but that's something we're looking forward to. But uh, in terms of mm -hmm. on the ground, granular like yeah. lessons, because I think we're learning those, right? We, yeah. You know, and it's, it, we're kind of debating like what was most effective. Like in the, the first day, um, we marched in, in a climate march and we, we moved with a crowd and maybe you know, 50 people in front of us and 10 behind us, like heard our slogans probably yeah. over and over again too many times. <laughs> um, and the second day, you know, we, we parked ourselves basically at the front of the march on the sidewalk. And I think we got exposure to thousands of, yeah. of people. Yeah. And, you know, again, we got fists in the air from some, um, we got engagement from, you know, workers unions. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some like cool conversations. We did have the anti-nukes try and hold their silly sign in front of us. And we said, Hey guys, mm -hmm. like feel free to like share your opinions, but like, why don't you just go to the side? Like, yeah, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, um, those grassroots tactics, I think there's just such a need, like there is now this global network, right? Um, Standard for Nuclear's done an awesome job. Um, you know, mm. we've got this, we've got, I don't know if the viewers can see this, but we have this big world map in front of us. <laughs> and like, you know, you can, see, you can look at all the countries, um, you know, South Africa had a stand up, 
um, Taiwan. Uh, you know, we're going to Berlin uh, yeah. on Saturday uh, with James Hansen again. Yeah. You know um, Zoolander, that movie? Yeah. Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so like granularly, like tactics that we can share, demonstration, demonstration. We talked about polar bears. Mm -hmm. Amazing, right? Yeah. Give me some other ideas, things you've learned. <laughs> well, we decided that the polar bears uh, need to have like a speaker inside of the bear, <laughs> um, so they can they have can project voice. they can have a voice and project a little bit more. I've I've uh, I think I found what I, I think is the ideal like march speaker to have. There's a, you know a strap on it, two microphones. And uh, if you want to do something like uh, you know uh, beatbox or sing sing little songs right. uh, to to back up your your friend who's uh, shouting facts about nuclear yeah. through a megaphone, um, that option is I available mean, you had, to you. you. Had, like good good feedback for me, like on a vocal level, because <laughs> you know I was uh, I think I was like sharing some really good messages. Um, but you were saying I sounded a bit like, just in the tonality, a bit like a prophet of doom. And, <laughs> and I think there's yeah. so much to like showing that we're kind of goofy and friendly. Yeah. Um, and so we talked about sort of doing a back and forth or like, you yeah. know, f finding ways to make it uh, like comedic and, and lighthearted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Polar bears, that was amazing. Like there were mm -hmm. like mothers bringing their kids up to pose in front of a polar bear that's with a oh, sign that says i love nuclear energy right like yeah and then they get a they get a postcard as they walk away of a little little animated uh a little illustrated polar bear holding a piece of uranium with a smile on his face like that's <laughs> a that'll leave a good taste in your mouth you know yeah yeah so uh, that that was very interesting that's um that's the postcard yeah Ooh, i don't know if that's in focus but yeah <laughs> i'm sure it is that's, that's a good camera <laughs> All right, Eric, um, I, uh, I'm away from my son and I have the chance to have a phone call as uh, like a FaceTime with him. I don't want to miss, but we do have like a couple more kind of closing minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to, you know, pass the mic over to any kind of last words, anything you want to, you want to share. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm so proud of nuclear advocates this year. They have stepped up in so many different ways in so many different countries. It like it just if I think about it too long, I mean, some tears are gonna start coming down my face. Uh, but it's just incredible to see so many people realize that they have a, a a personal duty, a personal responsibility, and a a big contribution to make to this cause. And they can really kind of kind of leave their fingerprints on the world in a, in a super positive way, you know, something they can tell their, their kids and grandkids, like, you know how we have 1,500 reactor, 2,000 reactors operating around the world? Well, back in my day, <laughs> it was only 440, and it was shrinking rapidly yeah. um, until we decided. We're such, Eric, we're such fucking nerds. I know, like, I know. I, I, I may be a little more like I try and be optimistic. Staying solutions phone keeps me optimistic, but it's like at the very least, I'll say to my son, like, I tried. Yeah. I fucking try. You can, you, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and the world's slightly better, hopefully, because of those <laughs> efforts. Yeah, maybe uh, we still have whales versus. So here's what whales were. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely want to have that first conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, between um, influencing the sustainable finance tax side, I mean, we. Uh, with with all of our allies, I think there are uh, almost 20 pro nuclear uh, local organizations uh, throughout Europe now uh, that uh, would help translate this letter to members of the European Commission and, and then distribute it to their followers. And within a week, we had sent five over 5,000 letters to the European Commission in support of nuclear energy. It's never happened before. Right. And you could see, I think it was just the, the following week or, or something like that, there was a news article that came out and uh, it was like, yeah, we're going to probably include nuclear in the second delegated act. And yeah. of, course, of course, Germany and, and Luxembourg and Austria had feelings about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But it does look really good right now that uh, at least uh, uh, nuclear will be included um, alongside gas. Uh, so, um, so it's a it's a good it's a, a good start we can build on. Right. You know, it's funny you you mentioned uh, in 2015, I believe, in Paris when uh, James Hansen, Ken Caldera, Tom Wigley, these other folks came out. Yeah. And uh, like thinking about the seeds that we're planting, um, there's a great article called "Mr. Hansen Goes to China," and you know after really uh, Hansen's. I guess discussed at you know the blah 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 at COP um, over and over again. 
Um, he's a very pragmatic thinker. You got to find this article. Mr. Hansen goes to, uh, I think it might be in The Economist, but he hopped on a plane, brought a delegation to China, and he said, listen, and he made the pitch. He's like, China's the place that can do this, right? That can be a world leader. Um, this confluence of factors, you know, being able to build large infrastructure projects, having a, a nuclear industry that's starting to really take off. Like you guys can can do this and this can be the base and you can be a, a model for the world in terms of, mm. you know, the, the best technologies to deal with this or the essential technology to deal with climate change. Mm. Um, and he met with, um, you know, a large group of Chinese nuclear engineers. Um, and I think he felt kind of like it, it didn't do anything. Mm. But, you know, seeds take a while to germinate. Um, and there was just mm. this announcement of $480 billion investment. Um, and they're going to be building 150 gigawatts of nuclear um, over the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, Massive. So that's, that's huge. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's my hope that, um, and that's part of the sort of end of politics that can make decoupling possible, <laughs> you know, is that uh, my own country, uh, you know, more broadly, you know, where you're from, the U.S., yeah. um, that Europe can uh, get its head screwed on right um, and, and get this thing going. I mean, uh, my, my prime minister, uh, when asked about nuclear, had a very sort of kind of sort of maybe all options on the table ish. Um, you know, yeah. provinces are doing stuff, you know, but not, not any kind of endorsement. And I was like, buddy, like a reactor, yeah. you know, designed in your country, yeah. uh, which produces, you know, enormous quantities of medical isotopes. You've all heard the pitch before, um, but that, you know, green layers of greenhouse gas reduction in North mm -hmm. America with the coal phase out, mm -hmm. like you could have been up there bragging. Like oh, you have yeah. something to be proud of. So much. And maybe you could help sort of, you know, help the Canadian economy by, by promoting CANDU and getting it built in other places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other nations having the medical isotopes possibilities, et cetera. And, you know, it's just... It's, it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating. I, I think he'll be sounding a different tune next cop after next cop. after seeing how present the pro nuclear uh, force is here. I mean that that it gives politicians uh, more more permission yeah. to to come out more strongly and say you know it's not just me, my mm -hmm. constituents. There's a, a huge movement that's growing here yeah. with 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 scientific support. Um, and that they, they don't feel like they're out on a limb as much. Well, and, and the politics that can make it possible in the UK of all places under Boris fucking Johnson, <laughs> they're, they're kind of going back. Like these were the, the, the UK was the champion of electricity market deregulation, you know, mm -hmm. privatization, spot pricing, um, which did enormous damage to nuclear and drove up financing costs to like Hinkley Point. Is it 15% or am I exaggerating? <laughs> Two thirds of the cost of Hinkley Point C is from interest right. on the financing. It's like imagine if you bought a nuclear plant on a credit card. Yeah, <laughs> so it's not right. Like that, but it's like, <laughs> yeah. and you know you pay it off over like thirty years or something. It's crazy. So uh, yeah, having I think what you're we're going towards is that regulated asset base. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, no loans for for nuclear plants can effectively be in, you know insured by by the government of the UK now. And uh, that's going to bring down the, the risk profile and the interest rate uh, dramatically. It's huge for building new nuclear in this and country. This is like, it's, it's just wild to me because this is back to the future. This is, yeah. this is going back to, you know, we need to 2x, 3x our grids. Mm -hmm. You know, Edgardo Sepulveda, who's been on the podcast many times, talks about like what was the political regulatory environment in place that allowed like the mm -hmm. U.S. to like add 6, 7% capacity to its grid every year. And it was that kind of policy. And this is a reversal of that, I guess, Thatcherism, Reaganomics. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, it's advocacy in part. Um, it's an energy crisis as well, right? So, yeah. you know, who knows what could shift the tide? Like if gas gets really expensive, maybe Pickering makes a lot more sense. Um, anyway, we'll see what the future has in hold, Eric. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I've had an interesting time at COP. I'm only kind of three days in. Um, mm -hmm. Looking forward to seeing what we can do in the next in the next uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for coming on Decouple. Oh man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah.